Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Friday. It's a cool start to a Friday. It's very interesting, I guess. So, I hope you guys like it. Just on that topic of, you know, I grew up in Joburg and kind of my two main influences, one, my mother was an art teacher growing up. Um, I thought art sucked. I thought it wasn't cool. Um, it was only for the really clever girls in, in school and the really nerdy boys. So, I wasn't into it. But she used to tell the kids and used to tell me that everyone's an artist, everybody's natural. It's born in you to push and pull and investigate and be great. And another major turning point in my life was when I was doing graffiti, but I didn't really understand the, the tagging. And I said, there's a whole culture that comes from it from the 80s, which is amazing because it's a, it's a whole movement. And I really like that. But what happened for me is I wanted to paint my first mural and couldn't really get a wall in my neighborhood. So I crossed the main highway over to the outskirts of Alexandria Township. And this was at a time when they started putting up the green gates in the suburbs of Joburg. And I asked a gentleman for permission to paint his wall and I spent four days there as a 16 year old. And that was amazing because none of the kids in my life all white private school upbringing were having this experience, maybe driving past that road, but I was there for four days every day and asking a lot of questions and that shifted my attitude towards South Africa weather. And through street art, it's allowed me to explore communities around the world um, and also try to make a difference in these communities uh, through inspiration, through art. And for, for that, I'm forever grateful to graffiti and street art and art uh, generally. I'm trying to create positive work in public space. I really want people to like it. Um, this, ironically, got me firing 1,500 Rand by the city of Cape Town. <laughs> but I'll get to that later in my presentation. Um, <clears throat> so, I believe removing the grayness from the soul of the city is the job of musicians, artists, and poets. Going back to my mom's philosophy that everybody's a creative, then it's your duty to then share that. And the best place to do that is public space. So, walking down the streets and some guy singing in the park or, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a shared collective um, creativity as a young kid and it's obviously better to go play with other kids and make up an imagination together to go climb a tree and he's the king, he's the queen, oh, she's the queen and everybody plays in and everybody adds a layer to this game or you can go on your own and have some, you know, but it's better to play with other people so take it to the streets basically. Um, this is some of my work that you might recognize on Albert Road. This is a mural I painted in Baltimore um, for a mural, international mural art project. Community and the culture on the street level, um, which, which is very raw and very authentic. And Woodstock's given that to me, and so it's painting murals in Woodstock. And the people that appreciate them the most is that community, and that gives me a lot of joy. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm not sure being an artist will be enough, so I choose to be an art activist. Uh, I choose to facilitate other art projects, uh, more than my own art, and also to try to organize events or initiatives that can change the world through creativity. So we're doing a lot of workshops with kids and a lot of painting in uh, poor communities. But then at the same time, it's also to re-inspire, like you guys today, or uh, any general folk that we are all creative, so this event, 1000 Drawing, was to raise money for charity, but at the same time raise awareness that creativity can change the world and everybody can get on that frequency, you know, um, making it fun, making it exciting, um, making it something that everybody can connect to. So the musicians were dressed up and everything was on all on paper and you could draw on it. And, um, we had two and a half thousand people, we collected four and a half thousand drawings over three months. Um, and it was at different levels of a building, it was just like a, a creative celebration. So, not only did we raise money, but we also raised that creative spirit within everyone. Um, a similar idea is Paperbill, which is in 18 cities around the world, where you collect art on paper over months from anyone and everyone. And over the course of a few hours, you just you roll it up, and 50 of your bicycles distributed to the local community. So it's the, unsuspecting gift of art, you know? And everybody gets a little pack and, and it's like a lucky packet of, of rolled up art 
works. And it's very special to be able to give and very special to be able to watch people receive that because we bombarded with um, I guess advertising and we're trying to get sold something all the time. So when someone does this this kind of radical act, it, it, it changes your day, you know? And it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, I'm really interested in the idea that if if art can change the world, then what really is it? Is it like an airy fairy belief in my heart, or is it actually a scientific thing that color creates energy, energy creates inspiration, and inspiration creates change? Uh, I've seen it; it's changed my life. And daily, I'm kind of inspired by this idea. So I really am interested in working towards the science for art for social change, and, and, and incubating these ideas, and going back to communities and finding out how it can be affected, but to grow the projects to be more responsible, more community generated and more um, ongoing. So not necessarily sustainable, but to continue year after year on the same idea and to investigate and to rebuild and to, to refine, to get better at that idea and to hopefully have a project that really says, you know, art is not a luxury, it's not, a, it's not for elite or it's not for um, um, the special, it's actually a remedy for a creative revolution or change in, in, in us to create inspiration to then help create change in the world. Um, so again, going to all kinds of amazing communities around the world. This was in the Gambia, where we took artists from around the world and we painted in a village. The big question was, did we belong there? And why should we put this art there? And uh, I want to share a video that I actually just got from the filmmaker a few days ago, so no one's seen it yet. Everything under, and that's a word of art, 
Um, so where do I it's not just a physical space, um, but also acts as a gallery, acts as a studio, acts as a headquarters, um, and also acts as a showroom for all these projects. Um, so this is the gallery space. Um, I'm also trying to create affordable art so that, you know, people that... Uh, Andy Wall said that everybody should have art and they should have it in their toilet. You know, it's the best place to have art, you spend the most time. And kind of he's right, because if we are all creative, then we should all have art around us. Our environment should be inspiring, it should be happy, it should be colourful. Um, so I'm trying to offer that service for both the artists to be able to create and produce and hand it over to someone to own it in their toilet, um, as well as um, people just to, to view it, not necessarily buy. Um, this is the current exhibition, which I encourage you all to come see. It's by the Black Rock Gang, and it is absolutely incredible. This, this, this collective has created uh, a very radical world and brought it to life. Um, the Woodstock Industrial Centre, we moved there five years ago and uh, we were one of the first creative tenants of old industrial building and now has been resold and is refurbished with new creative tenants and is kind of dramatically changing the landscape around the area and again shows the power of what art can do in not only uh, cultural relevance but in capital uh, influence on the economy and on society. Um, we've got a studio in the back there, as I said, big part of the headquarters. Um, we organise a lot of murals. So, in the last three years, we've hosted 27 artists from around the world on a residency program, and most of those artists are mural artists or visual artists that would like to paint the mural, would like to be involved in community outreach projects. So that's our thing. And we have some examples in the world being organised around Cape Town.
to the world. She was the first person to find a photo prophet and hip hop culture, and pretty much wrote the Bible. And uh, it was an honor to invite her, and she stayed here for a month. And she was born in uh, southwest Baltimore, uh, which was nicknamed Soweto after Soweto in the 60s. And no one knows why, except for the rumor that. Uh, Soweto was the gutter of Africa and Soweto was the gutter of Baltimore. And if anyone knows The Wire, the TV show, that's where, um, that's Southwest Baltimore. Um, so basically she started to know, she's been documenting her neighborhood for the last seven years. No one knows she's a famous superstar photographer. Everybody thinks she's a crazy old white lady who takes photographs in the community. And she takes these photographs but she actually then prints out a copy and gives it to the community. It's very special thing for her, it's her private like, project. And she noticed all these familiarities between Sawebo and Soweto, and so now her next book idea is Sawebo Soweto, and kind of juxtaposing the exact similarities um, that these places have. And this is Soweto on the left, and Sawebo on the right. Um, and so she made this little exhibition, and made a little booklet, and it's all on the website. Um, and that was like probably one of the most remarkable experiences for me, because She's just such an amazing person. It's come full circle to, to me and South Africa. Um, this is her photographs from the 60s. This is the first photograph she ever took of graffiti, and this is. Um, she got, sorry, I'm going on a tangent here, but the New York Post asked her to write an article on the crack epidemic in the Bronx. And so she went there and she found these kids playing and making up their own games jump, skip, rope, marbles, bottle rock, and all these things. And she said, No, I'm not going to write a story on the cracks, I'm going to write a story on this. And they didn't want to publish it, and so she just continued to document this idea and she made her first book called Street Games. And then at the end of the book, she met this guy, and he was, she was like, what is this? He's like, it's graffiti, come with me. And basically introduced her to the world of graffiti and was the first person to document it. Um, and going to the train yards with these kids who were known as anarchists, but really they were culturally excited. They were just they were in love with the idea of making art. Um, so they weren't in games, they were um, cool, and unfortunately the demonization of graffiti has told us that it's, um, well, the broken window theory has told us that graffiti is bad. Um, when in fact it actually, this is a bunch of kids playing with color, trying to be naughty, but also being very creative. So, people used to write her letters from around the world, and in Cape, in Cape Town we have a pioneer of Emil Jansen, in 1988 he was a school teacher, he wrote her a letter. So when she came here, she had this letter, and we went to go see him in Mitchell's play. And these are the first four hip hop graffiti people in South Africa. And these are the guys that actually started it here. I mean, I, I saw grown men cry on this day. It was cool. Um, and they've got all the photographs and all the postcards and letters that they used to write in the late 70s, early 80s. And that's the first piece of graffiti in South Africa that's still up um, in Mitchell's play. And there's the artist Jemmo. So just to I'll quick summarize, I spoke about the broken window theory. There's a bylaw in Cape Town that says all of this is illegal. You need a permit from the city, you need a neighboring, a neighbor's signature, and you need a homeowner's signature, and you have to submit your design to the city. So we're combating this and saying, um, you can't be such a custodian of art city. Street art is very alive and very um, positive thing, and, and I'm an organized person now, you're telling me I must apply for a permit, and then I must reapply, and I must go through all this red tape, it's not going to work. And so, we fought it for a while, we got a petition over a, a, a couple of months, we got a lot of people to back us with legal advice telling us that it's unconstitutional to take away the homeowner's right to decorate the property as they wish. Um, there's uh, in the constitution that states you shouldn't make any um, hate speech or public slander or violence, nudity or anything of this uh, form in public space and so therefore we don't need a bylaw to prevent uh, people making artwork in space. So we pretty much debated with the city and my argument is that no permission equals vandalism, permission equals a mural. Um, because people must get away from this idea that graffiti is this thing, this is the idea, it's a, it's, a, it's a seed of something bigger like I'm showing you these mural artists around the world. And so we started to educate um, and explain that it's become a global movement. The museums around the world that all have retrospects on graffiti art and history. Um, some of the biggest high end selling artists around the world are graffiti street artists. Um, so we, we didn't just argue, we pro proposed an alternative solution that we submitted five months ago and we're still waiting to hear back from them. Um, but we haven't stopped and next week we're meeting with Creative Cape Town and a few other specific people um, 
that we're going to form a one body group and then put pressure on the health and safety portfolio who's passed this by, which is not the creative people for the city, and really change the law. Um, but it's quite cool in Cape Town how we can do things like this. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions and answers. Well, what we've got right at the back. I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat the questions. Okay, the questions about how, how the funding happens. A lot of it's not funded, but then uh, it's a lot brand or private or or self funded. So each project needs a funder. Um, but what I'm trying to do now more is to like having a physical space is to be more self funded because with sponsorship or a patron comes. Well, actually, with sponsorship comes an agenda, with the patron comes an agenda, like, I hope. Um, so, that's the ambition, is to just to continue to do projects, sometimes that I don't like, some parts of, but to learn from them and to make money, make, take the savings and put it into something that I, I really do care about. But if you were to strip that away, like, get rid of all the bureaucracy, free form, like, how do you think that would... Uh, I suppose the city's worried that it's just going to become a mess, but yeah. do you feel it's self-regulating? Do you feel like if it's a mess, then it's a mess, it's reflective of the city? Like, how do you feel about no regulation? Um, yeah, that's the city's argument. That's the number one argument for us. And uh, the answer is it's not going to become the wild west. There's not enough people that are doing it, and art doesn't jump off the wall and just have to be faced, and it doesn't. It's not that big a deal. The, the head of... Um, I don't know what department in Joe Riga, there was a public art conference two weeks ago and I asked them, I said, what is your policy? What can you offer us from Cape Town? I said, look, really, when graffiti becomes a problem and someone complains, then we deal with it. But if it's not really such a big problem, we've got other things to deal with. And then I was like, so people are really protecting the landscape, the visual landscape in Cape Town. And that's appreciative. And mountains, ocean, view, all of that I support. Um, so there will always be vandalism and the city must continue to spend money to clean up the vandalism like every other city around the world, not just graffiti vandalism, uh, litter. And um, <clears throat> they must combat it like that, but being less strict on these regulations will encourage more artists. So the kid will paint, like me, his graffiti is graffiti and then very much quicker than later all he wants to paint in Europe because his parents support him, because his school teacher says it's cool, not because graffiti is a mischievous thing. When the mayor took over and he fixed the windows and borders, it's beautiful. People will not want to destroy it. That will just feed the Okay, it's a comment from uh, I think it was Manager Yanni's broken window policy where they cleaned up the city, but I think there's still room for, despite that, there's areas that reveal themselves as being part of space level to art, I guess. Yeah, um, Mayor Giorani not only cleaned the city, but he also hired graffiti artists to paint murals. And that's not in the, you know, that was part of it too. So it's like a broken window theory can go reverse too. Um, and so the community, that's the broken window theory. It's not really about graffiti or broken windows. It's really about how the community takes responsibility. And that's included. And so therefore there should be arts, there should be public spaces, there should be uh, self pride and self uh, Policing, you know, we like to, to make sure the community is safe and clean. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there's, there's a very big stigma with the idea. Any uh, street artists that are watching this video, thank you for me. I love that. Love your work. Okay, thank you.